So um, as Neda said, I'll be speaking about a paper. Um, it's currently under review, but um, there's still lots of room for improvement. So I'm happy to share the paper with anyone who's interested. I welcome um, all feedback you have. Uh, this is with Alice Toth, who's a fabulous graduate student at Stanford on the job market next fall, if anyone is uh, looking. And um, the title is, Are Quotas in Two Dimensions Better Than One? Intersectional Representation and Group Relations in India. Um, so here, the, um, our core question is, can descriptive political representation bridge the social divides created by enduring multidimensional exclusion? And here, the, the big picture for us is, does equality actually breed more equality? Um, and so the more concrete question is, do quotas that mandate representation of excluded groups on two dimensions improve support for intergroup relationships relative to what we typically see, which are quotas that mandate representation on one dimension alone? Um, and here, we seek to tackle this fundamental challenge for deliberative democracy, which is what do we do when political exclusion overlaps with systemic, social, or economic subordination, which unfortunately it often does. And what people like Jenny Mansbridge tell us is that um, when this occurs, it typically breeds inattention, even arrogance on the part of the dominant group, and distrust on the part of the subordinate group. Uh, where this domination endures, quotas are one institutional innovation which have been wildly popular in, uh, in the past few decades uh, to disrupt social hierarchy. Um, and the challenge with quotas is that they often seek to remedy one form of exclusion, and yet we know that systemic oppression is not simple, uh, that it often occurs via these interlocking processes where exploitation in one domain reinforces discrimination that we see in others. Um, and so um, the theories that we leverage here uh, are those of intersectionality, uh, which provide us some intuition as to why descriptive representation may have these unintended consequences. Um, and this is, you know, the fundamental insight is that, uh, that, that oppression is actually a multidimensional phenomenon. Um, and so here, this helps us uh, get some intuition as to why descriptive representation, um, uh, which, you know, can, groups can receive uh, gains of representation in some domains, um, doesn't just make it, society more equal, but we actually see strengthening uh, systemic exploitation in other dimensions at the same time. Um, and if this happens, we argue this is really consequential because it prevents the formation of exactly those intergroup connections that people like de Tocqueville tell us are fundamental to stick, stitching together democratic society. So, um, you know, when we, uh, when we think about why and, why and how quotas might actually help solve um, multidimensional oppressions, they're generally two camps. And so on one side, we have optimists who say, you know, best case scenario, uh, quotas actually serve to equalize power between groups and thus reduce exclusion and alter perceived norms, whether that's purely strategic behavior or um, it's based on sincerely held beliefs. Uh, on, on the other end, there's lots of empirical evidence uh, on this side. Um, on the alternative side, we also have great empirical evidence, um, which uh, primarily motivated by the notion that political parties have enduring strength, and they're particularly important for not just financing, but promoting uh, a range of candidates. And as a result, um, we shouldn't expect that quotas alone um, actually fundamentally change the balance of power. Um, and in the worst case, they may actually increase conflict by mobilizing broad coalitions against perceived threats to social status. And so what we try to do with our intersectional theory is to explain why both of these processes may be simultaneously at work. Uh, so one-dimensional quotas uh, make one particular identity politically salient, um, and so we expect that they will actually advance equality on that dimension. Um, however, at the same time, they kind of give cover um, to other policies that reinforce or exacerbate inequality in other domains. And so that tension between you know, partial promotion of equality in some domains and um, diminishment of equality in other domains, we expect will fail to improve intergroup relations. Um, in contrast, two-dimensional quotas bring minority women to power. So the format we're going to be looking at are uh, quotas for ethnic minorities as well as gender quotas for women. 
Um, and here, because restricting women's agency is a core strategy for maintaining hierarchies of race, of ethnicity, and of gender, um, we believe that minority women actually have a unique incentives and capacity to disrupt these multidimensional systems of oppression. And so the um, observable implication here is that we expect to see reduced perceived acceptability of discrimination and um, improved relationships across groups. So the case, um, as Nana has already mentioned, that we're going to be looking at is India. Um, and so I just want to give you a little uh, kind of sense of the texture of, of intergroup relations here. Um, and so just in the words of one really fantastic journalist, Banu Priya Rao, uh, says, Dalit and Adivasi women in Punchayat politics. So um, members of scheduled castes, formerly untouchables, and scheduled tribes who have um, uh, had um, particularly backward conditions, according to the Indian constitution, in local politics uh, have to negotiate multiple time, types of oppression, rigid caste structures in the village, and also patriarchy both within and outside their families. Um, and so just to give you a sense of why this is actually relevant in electoral politics, um, you can see this picture here, uh, sorry, many, <laughs> yeah, of uh, these three women, the one woman in the center uh, is named Kay Mutukani. She is a, a Dalit woman, and she ran for, for local elected office explicitly to contest these caste and gender hierarchies. She won. Um, and then when she, she went to physically enter the Panchayat building to, to occupy this role she was elected to fill, um, men from her own caste and from other castes um, kind of, you know, created this really strong coalition and physically blocked her from entering office. So in order to occupy the role that she was elected to fill, she had to build her own panchayat building. So she was really effective coalition builder. She got lots of private support. Uh, she built a new building. And uh, you know, at its inauguration, she publicly committed and you know, continued to do so in the future um, to having this panchayat building be open to people of all castes and of all genders. Um, and so that, I think, is just one example of the potentially transformative power of women from these typically excluded ethnic groups. OK, so just to give you, you know, just the, the, the simple version of our, you know, the, the contribution we think we make in terms of the observable implications of intersectional theory as opposed to what we've got already. So optimistic theories expect we'll see you know, positive benefits for intergroup relations from any kind of one-dimensional quota, whether it be for women or for ethnic minorities. Um, and no, nothing to say about two-dimensional quotas. And we see the reverse predictions for um, skeptics or cautionary theories um, expect you know, negative impact on intergroup relations, regardless of the type of one-dimensional quota, no idea about two-dimensional quotas. Our argument is that we should expect null to negative impacts of one-dimensional quotas. And in, in contrast, we should see a positive impact of two-dimensional quotas, um, which, which not only uh, work to, to kind of repair the backlash to one-dimensional quotas, but open space for um, you know, transformative, more egalitarian uh, relationships across groups. OK, so um, our research design seeks to um, exploit the world's largest experiment for allocating electoral authority, uh, uh, sorry, electoral opportunity, also authority, um, by using quotas for women. And also here, we're particularly interested in uh, quotas for members of scheduled tribes as heads of local government, known as pradhans, sarpanches, or presidents. And um, these are exogenously imposed by constitutional amendments at the national level as of 1993. Um, and women's quotas uh, reserve at least a third of gram panchayat, so local government heads uh, for female candidates. And these are randomly allocated across ethnic groups. So that's our main identification strategy. Um, we're also interested in quotas for scheduled tribes. These reserve Grand Panchayat heads uh, for members of scheduled tribes in proportion to the subdistrict population that they, they occupy. So this is, creates slightly greater uh, hurdles for causal inference. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, and we argue this is an consequential intervention because these Pradhans are really gatekeepers. So they're pivotal in uh, local government policy design, in resource allocation, and in the enforcement of rights. 
Okay, so the data we use, um, we have a few different data sets. Our primary one is the Rural Economic and Demographic Survey, or REDS, that was conducted by the National Council for Applied Economic Research. Started in 2006, ended in 2009, because it's an extremely long survey. It's the longest survey I've ever seen. It's over 135 pages like for one person. Um, but they cover uh, 8,659 households across 240 rural villages in 17 major Indian states. Um, the secondary data set we leverage is by Thad Dunning and Janavi Nilkani. Uh, and this is on local quotas and receipt of public benefits. Um, and this uh, covers a little bit smaller set, uh, just under 7,000 respondents across 508 village clusters in four major Indian states. Um, and what's unique here is that their sampling strategy was to match uh, villages that were reserved for members of scheduled tribes or caste with those that were not. So they have great balance here. Uh, so throughout uh, our tests, we're mainly interested in what's happening across all respondents. That's what I'm going to have time to show you today. But we also um, look at uh, subgroup specific effects uh, by gender and uh, by gender within the, the subset of scheduled tribes. Um, and we have data from REDS on three rounds of uh, elections. So starting with, with the first year of elections with quotas, 1993, and extending until 2009. Um, and the main outcomes we're interested in um, is willingness to cross caste boundaries. Um, so specifically, particularly relevant for these outcast groups, so members of scheduled tribes as well as castes. Um, and so we measure this in two ways. The first is a question, um, you know, subjectively asking people to assess um, how easy is it for you to interact with other castes in public. So this is really capturing kind of the texture of daily public relationships. And the second measure um, is, is something that, that captures um, you know, slower moving <laughs> changes, um, but the ones that are, are really consequential for these intimate relationships, which are actually foundational to building um, higher end and extending hierarchies of, of caste and gender, which is willingness to marry someone from another caste. Um, and there are huge social sanctions, honestly, that apply in both of these domains. So we, we expect social desirability bias to, um, to push against finding any changes occurring. Um, we also, um, in thinking about the mechanisms apl that apply, um, in brief, our expectation is that um, what quotas do is they change the perceived acceptability or you know, perceived social acceptability of exclusion, so perceived norms about um, the acceptability of exclusion. And we look at this in two ways. The first is through an index of political participation. And here we're particularly interested in women across castes are much less likely to participate than men. So do we see um, uh, you know, reduction in the political ex reduction in the political exclusion of women? And we also look at um, intercaste conflicts. So we ask about the number of conflicts each person has experienced for each relevant electoral round. Um, and so the, the identification strategy here uh, is to treat India's quotas as these natural quasi-experiments where the central state expands access to political power via quotas in this as-if random manner uh, that's implemented by federal states. And women's reservations, um, as I document in my book, are frequently as-if random, but not always. Um, and so what we do here is for our main results, we exclude states that utilize non-random uh, methods of quota implementation, as well as um, the very late implementers. There are two states waited a decade to implement these reforms. Um, so that's the main results, but everything I'm going to show you is robust to it, the, looking at the full sample. Um, and the, uh, the, the second uh, set of reservations, these for scheduled tribes, as I mentioned, um, do present some hurdles for causal identification because they nearly always rely on the proportion uh, of, sub, uh, of scheduled tribes in the subdistrict population. Uh, so we have a few different strategies we employ here. Um, one of them is nearest neighbor matching on the proportion of the scheduled tribe population uh, in a subdistrict measured right before quotas were implemented, so 1991. Um, we also, throughout all regressions, all, all of all the analysis, uh, we have subdistrict level fixed effects and trends. Um, and finally, we have this data set from uh, Thad Dunning and Janavi Neokani, where uh, we actually have perfect balance on uh, quota status. Um, so 
you know, for for this to be an effective um, uh, way to isolate this, you know, as if exogenous uh, change in, in descriptive representation, we actually need to have compliance with this randomly allocated quota status. And um, I'm not going to show you the tables, you know, the, uh, all of the graphs right now, just in the interest of time. But I'm happy to return to this. And we see close to perfect compliance, so 97% compliance with women's quotas, um, and actually perfect compliance with caste quotas. Um, so uh, to be on the conservative side, we interpret this as um, uh, the, the result on uh, quotas impact as an intention to treat effect. Uh, we also use reservation status as an instrument for protons, gender, and caste, and uh, calculate the local average treatment effect. And we present both of those estimates in our tables, which I'm not going to show you right now, but again, happy in the Q&A to show you. We see very similar results, actually stronger um, for uh, the local average treatment effects, which suggests the work is really being done by quotas themselves. So good news. Uh, so our main estimation strategy uh, is, uh, is presented here. The important uh, things to note are that we have fixed effects for subdistricts, for election period, and whenever we can use multiple rounds of elections, also for subdistrict specific election periods. Um, we have a vector of controls for things that you might worry um, w would influence um, perceptions, so uh, familial land holding, birth cohorts, grandparents' education, um, the proportion of the population occupied by scheduled tribes, and prior quota exposure. And throughout, we're calculating heteroscedasticity, robust standard errors, which are clustered at the level at which quotas are assigned, which is the village level. Um, and just to, so what we're really interested in is theta. It's the, the coefficient on um, the interaction of exposure to quotas for women and for, to members of scheduled tribes. And this is telling us the impact of um, you know, what, what happens when these randomly allocated quotas for women uh, coincide with quotas for scheduled tribes in comparison to villages where you only have these one-dimensional quotas for scheduled tribes. Um, so the results, and I'm just going to check my time. Um, OK, I've, I only have three tables to show, three, three charts, so we will get through them. OK, so um, so this I'm kind of trying to show you a lot of things in a, in a small space. Um, so let me say there, there are two kinds of information um, on, uh, on these graphs. So on the left hand side, these are just descriptive statistics. Um, these are uh, standardized means, so the, the means for each quota type. So yellow is quota, one-dimensional quotas for scheduled tribes, blue one-dimensional quotas for women, um, and this orange-red is two-dimensional quotas for women from scheduled tribes. Um, so they, these are all standard, uh, standardized um, around uh, a mean of zero for uh, the control group. So this is villages without any quotas and um, with, to have a standard deviation of one. And then on the right-hand side, what I'm showing you are the marginal effects. So this is the, the coefficient theta um, on two-dimensional quotas, okay, which is what we, we really want to focus on. But so first to just say, um, what do we see? And uh, you know, the main effects we're interested in are the first two rows. So uh, these are, are measures of um, the quality of intergroup relations. And we see um, when it comes to how easy it is for respondents to, to interact across casts, we actually see um, significant drop in the proportion of respondents who say it's easy to interact across caste in the presence of scheduled tribe quotas. Um, and, uh, and we see a similarly uh, high magnitude drop in willingness to marry across caste. So this seems like relation, the quality of relations really uh, across groups really drops in the presence of one dimensional uh, ethnic quotas. Um, what we see for one-dimensional women's quotas is not much change. If anything, there's a slight improvement in willingness to interact across castes. Um, this is driven by some groups that isn't, um, it isn't uh, uniform across groups. Um, and so in contrast, we actually see, if you, if you turn to the right-hand side, these are the regression coefficients for, for the impact of two, marginal impact of two-dimensional quotas. So having women from scheduled tribes as compared to having only members of scheduled tribes, we see significantly improves uh, the quality of intergroup relations. So specifically, we see um, an increase by 10.5 to 11.9 percentage points in um, the proportion of respondents who say that inter-caste inter, -caste, inter 
uh, actions are easy in public. Um, as this is significant at the 95 confidence level. And this holds across all subgroups for which we have statistical power to identify effects. And we see um, also a, a high magnitude increase in the willingness to marry across casts. Um, this increases by 12.5 percentage points, which is actually a 50% increase on the baseline. Um, and um, so what we see is um, when there are uh, just one-dimensional ethnic, ethnic, ethnic quotas, these worsen intergroup relations, um, not much change, or you could say at best partial improvement under one-dimensional women's quotas, but we actually see um, not only this repair and the backlash to one-dimensional quotas in the presence of two-dimensional quotas, but actually we see it, you know, they open the door to, to fundamental change in intergroup relations. Um, I, I know I'm just about out of time, but I want to say on the mechanisms, we do see um, caste conflict um, actually in increases significantly um, under one-dimensional uh, ethnic quotas redu reduces significantly under two-dimensional quotas, no change under one-dimensional women's quotas, and partic the participation in uh, index increases dramatically under two-dimensional quotas, and this is driven by uh, women's political participation. So these uh, ways in which we expect uh, to see reductions in the perceived acceptability of exclusion along both gendered and caste lines do seem to hold. And when we look into the future, when we look what's happened uh, five to 10 years after quota imposition, we see in general an attenuation of the effect sizes, except for the most vulnerable groups, except for women from scheduled tribes, for whom we actually see effect sizes increase. Um, so here we think this is, is, is re, you know, we, what we take from this is that changing intergroup relations is hard, it's slow, it takes time, but we do see um, two-dimensional quotas are, are able to start to transform relations. I won't talk about alternative mechanisms. The final thing I want to say is when we look across countries, um, we look at a total of 25 countries that have, some, uh, have, uh, have two types of quotas, um, and we see in the presence of two sets of quotas, not just for minority groups, um, but also for women, uh, we see increases in um, uh, perceived autonomy um, by male and female uh, minor quota minority groups. And we actually see across male and female dominant groups and quota minority groups um, redu redu reduction in exposure to, to racist behavior. Um, this is from the World Values Survey. So we do think um, there's, there's good news that um, that policies that place marginalized, multiply marginalized groups at the center can catalyze broader social transformation that benefits everyone and enables democracy to flourish. Thank you very much.